Oh, hello. I'm the ghost of chemical engineering present. What I would like to do today is to give you an idea of how the chemical industry has changed almost unrecognisably in the UK and the EU over the last 20 to 40 years. I'm standing in front of England's last steelworks up in Scunthorpe. The reason why I'm standing here is because it provides a very good analogy with which to illustrate what has happened to the chemical industry. The steelworks behind me was founded in 1859, a very similar era to the start of the chemical industry. That big expanse of land you can see between myself and the steelworks is one of the old ironstone quarries. The steelworks was sited next to a site of iron ore. Not far from here in Nottinghamshire were big coal collieries and coking coal could be sourced from there to feed the blast furnaces you see smoking away. Once the ironstone quarry was depleted, the nearby mines of Dragonby supplied all the iron ore. A wonderfully named place that sounds like it's come straight out of Tolkien, but today, too, those mines are closed. The steelworks behind me has changed hands a number of times in the last 10 to 15 years. It has faced insolvency. It has nearly closed on more than one occasion. The only reason that it can survive today is because that it imports iron ore. It imports coking coal and it's perceived to be of strategic importance to the country because it produces railway line. In many ways there's a strong analogy between this steelworks and the state of UK industry, chemical industry today. The raw materials supply chains that the chemical industry so vitally needs have changed a lot and we're going to discuss that to start with. We're going to see how that picture also reflects across the world. It reflects in the EU, it reflects in the USA. What we're going to also see is the explosive rise of the chemical industry in Asia and how that now is the epicentre of the global process industries. For the process industries that still remain within the UK and the EU, we're going to see a thread of hope. We're going to see how their environmental performance has improved dramatically over the last 10 to 20 years as a result of responding to net zero um, emissions. So, I'd like to start by describing the raw materials scene to you. On my whiteboard, I have a graph of UK coal and crude oil production. I've chosen the UK because it's an area I've worked in. This picture, however, is reflected in many parts of the world. If we think of coal production, since 1920, coal has been on a big decline. There's various peaks and troughs that you can see in this graph and you can relate those to strikes and depressions. But the notable thing is that right now in 2020, the UK virtually has no domestic coal production. If we look at crude oil production, crude oil production in, in domestic waters and on domestic land in the UK didn't really happen until the mid-1970s. The production rate ramped up very, very, very fast. It reached a peak in the early 2000s and has again dropped away significantly. Now, let's relate this to the changing face of chemicals production. In the UK, chemicals production at the turn of last century, 1900-1920, was vast. We produced almost 15% of the entire globe's chemicals. However, from, uh, from the Great Depressions of the 30s through the Second World War and beyond that, our share of the market fell to its current position of below 1%. That picture is reflected in the EU. In France, in Germany, we see a very similar trend. In the USA, we see a completely different trend. And at this point, it's rather useful to see how global events can change the industrial output of a country or set of countries. So, the line I've just put on this graph is World War I. We can see that the data points either side of World War I in Germany reflected a decline in its chemicals industry. However, in the UK and in France, to a point, it represented a more plateaued response. A bit of an increase or a bit of a decrease. It was the Great Depression in the USA that really harmed its chemicals output. Before and after the Depression, there was a huge drop in chemicals output, but a big rise in Germany. If we look at World War II, World War II severely impacted German chemicals production with a big decline, but was one of the drivers for growth in the USA and for other parts of the world as well. The UK output stabilised. 
If we look at the oil crisis in the 1970s, that hit production hard in the USA, but not so hard in Europe. If we look at the banking crisis of 2008, we can see that within the EU there was a notable decline before and after. And so this graph I've displayed to really show you how things have changed over the last hundred years, how these changes can be driven by big world events as well. So let's think about which areas of the world where chemicals output has risen. Let's look at the EU to start with since we've just seen data on the EU. The EU share of the global chemical industry has dropped markedly over the last 10 to 15 to 20 years, from roughly 35% down to around 17% today. Interestingly, however, the revenue associated with that market share has increased quite significantly above inflation rate. And so what we can see is that actually the global's chemical business has expanded a great deal. The EU's share may have dropped, but its revenues have increased. If we look at one of the representative Asian countries, China, the share of chemicals industry responsible for China has almost doubled between 2008 and 2020. It's a remarkable, remarkable rise. And as you might expect, the revenue associated with that has increased even more. So, in order to put this into some sort of context, let's think about global oil use today in 2020. On my whiteboard now, you can now see Grafham Water in Cambridgeshire. It's one of the biggest reservoirs in the UK for water. Now, imagine this. There are 600 operational oil refineries in the world today, with a total operating capacity of 5 times 10 to the 9 metric tonnes, which is roughly equivalent to 13.6 million metric tonnes of oil per day. These figures are really, really hard to visualise. But if you imagine that graphene water behind me was filled with crude oil, global demand would empty it in between three and four days. It's a shocking figure. Now, we've seen that actually the EU's chemical industry has increased in terms of revenue. It's also increased in terms of environmental metric. So there on the whiteboard now is a graph of the output relative to 1991 of the European chemicals industry. It's almost doubled, despite its global share almost halving. There on the graph now is the energy intensity associated with the European chemicals industry relative to 1991. It's fallen to about 40% of its 1991 value, reflecting massive increases in efficiency despite an almost doubling in size. So this starts to pay tribute to the hard work of the engineers, chemists and managers involved in trying to make its environmental performance a lot better. Because energy intensi ent intensity closely relates to greenhouse gas emissions. And so here on the board now, I've put a graph that shows a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions of the European chemical industry, again normalised to 1991, which shows a very, very similar decrease to energy intensity. So this has in part been brought around by energy intensity reductions, and in part by reductions in leaks of nitrous oxide and of HFCs, both of which are very, very potent greenhouse gases, much more so than carbon dioxide. Consequently, the largest chemical production site in the world actually is still in Germany. The picture I show on the whiteboard here is of the Ludwigshafen chemicals production site owned by BASF. BASF is the Bayerische Alkaline und Soda Fabrik and that name alone gives you a clue as to the industry's origins there. Alkaline and caustic soda. It's chloralkaline origin. There it is on a big canal and the statistics on this site are truly remarkable. It sells more than 8 million metric tonnes per year of chemical product. There's over 200 plants. There are 106 kilometres of roadway on site with 230 kilometres of railway. The length of the site pipelines are nearly 3,000 kilometres long. The land area it occupies is over 10 square kilometres. And the key parts of the infrastructure include ammonia synthesis, chloralkali synthesis, and naphtha crackers. So this is almost a chemical city that still operates in Europe today. 
This final graph I want to put on the board is a motivator for what I'm next going to talk about. It's the ratio of the EU to the US ethylene production price per tonne. We can see back in 2008 that the EU and the US ethylene prices were about the same. So sites like the Ludwigshaven site and sites like the domestic sites in the UK at Fife and at Grangemouth and at Wilton were on parity with the US in terms of production cost. But look what happened from about 2010 through to 2016. The US ethylene price dropped by a factor of three. What happened? Why has chemicals production been so greatly enhanced in the US over that period of time, thanks to this change in ethylene price. This is something we're going to discuss next. Now, a few key points. The picture I want to paint is of a very changing industry at the moment. Major industry follows raw materials and centres of demand. The once big epicentres of the US and the EU have moved east towards Asia. Global industry is growing very, very rapidly, driven in part by strong Asian development. Environmental performance per production unit has improved by a huge amount within the EU and the EU still is at home to the world's largest chemicals production site despite unfavourable energy prices at the moment. We will see next lecture that that demand in the US has been driven by a disruptive raw material that was found which is one of shale gas.